Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. In this letter, the Apostle John is writing to a church probably located in Asia Minor and possibly the church at Ephesus. But he's writing to this church in response to the activity of their former teachers. Teachers who had been members of their assembly but who had been teaching an early form of a heresy which later came to be known as Gnosticism. John was writing for the purpose of refuting their false teaching and that for the purpose of restoring to his readers the joy of their salvation, a salvation of which John was confident, but a salvation the assurance of which had been shaken by these false teachers. In verse 13 of 1 John 5, pointing back to the letter that he had just written, the apostle says, These things have I written unto you, in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And the things John had written for the stated purpose of strengthening their assurance, the things John had written in order that they may know that they have eternal life, can be boiled down to three issues. John's letter is made up of his repetition of three characteristics of those who are the true people of God. By inspiration of the Spirit, John says, everyone who has eternal life is habitually, not perfectly, but habitually, as a pattern of life, trusting Jesus as the Christ. He says everyone who has eternal life is habitually obedient to the Word of God. And everyone who has eternal life habitually loves the brethren. These are the three characteristics of a true child of God which John repeats over and over in this letter. Characteristics which their false teachers who claim to be in fellowship with God did not possess, but characteristics which John's readers, who were doubting that they were the true people of God, did possess. For the most part, John's letter is a repetition of these three characteristics in order that his readers may know that they have eternal life. Now, two weeks ago, in our last study, we came to what I am calling John's Conclusion. Up through verse 6 of chapter 4, John has dealt with these three major issues, these three characteristics of a true child of God, in a very clear and organized way. Discussing one characteristic, then moving on to a second characteristic, and then to a third. But beginning in verse 7 of chapter 4, John starts to bring this letter to a close with some concluding remarks concerning these three characteristics but concluding remarks in which rather than clear-cut divisions between the discussion of each characteristic, there is more of a blending of the characteristics together, suggesting that the true child of God is not just one who is trusting in Jesus as the Christ, or one who is obeying the Word of God, or one who is loving his Christian brethren, but rather the true child of God is one who is habitually practicing all three. Now, two weeks ago, we began to look at what I am calling John's conclusion concerning love of the brethren. Clearly, the issue which is the dominant issue in John's letter. And the first thing John addresses in this discussion is the fact of their love of the brethren. John says in the first part of verse 7 of chapter 4, Beloved, we are loving one another. And even though most, if not all, of our English translations translate this as an exhortation, Beloved, let us love one another, I suggested to you that another accurate translation, which better fits the context, is this statement of fact, Beloved, we are loving one another. In seeking to strengthen the assurance of his readers that they were indeed the true children of God, John reminds them of the fact that they, like him, were loving the brethren. He says, Beloved, we are loving one another. Then the second thing John does is to give an explanation for this love of the brethren. He says in verse 7 and verse 8 of chapter 4, Beloved, we are loving one another. Well, how do you explain that fact, John? We are loving one another because love is of God, and everyone that is loving has been begotten of God and knows God. 
He that is not loving does not know God because God is love. In an effort to strengthen their assurance, after stating the fact that they are loving one another, John explains the existence of that love by telling them that this love is from God. And everyone who is practicing such love, that is, everyone who practices this love for the brethren, that person has been born of God. The implication being that since it is a fact that you, my readers, are practicing love for the brethren, you have been born of God and know God. That best fits John's stated purpose for writing this letter. I am writing these things that you may know that you have eternal life. Then the third thing John does is to give the example of love of the brethren. Beginning in verse 9 of chapter 4, John says, In this was the love of God manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The kind of love John had observed in his readers, and the kind of love which John is encouraging more of, is the kind of love exemplified in God sending His own unique, one-of-a-kind Son into a hostile world for the purpose of tasting the wrath of His Holy Father that His people might live. That's the example of the sacrificial love we are to have for the brethren. Then the fourth thing John does is to point out the obligation to love the brethren. In verse 11 of chapter 4 he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And as we noted, this word ought is a word which speaks of duty or obligation. Beloved, if God in this manner loved us, we also are obligated, we also have a duty to love one another. God loved a people who deserved just the opposite. By inspiration of the Spirit, John says, those loved by God in this manner have an obligation to love one another in the same way in the same way as God's love for His people was not dependent upon our lovableness, our love for our brethren is also to be unconditional. Then the fifth and final thing we looked at was the significance of love of the brethren. Beginning in verse 12 of 1 John 4, the apostle says, No one hath beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. In this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we know and have believed the love which God hath in us. God is love and He that abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. The significance of one's loving the brethren is that it indicates that God abides in us and we abide in God. Now with that review behind us, this morning we will pick up at this point and look at the remainder of John's conclusion concerning love of the brethren and we will do that under the following headings. First of all, we will look at the fruit of of the love of the brethren. Then secondly, the consistency of love of the brethren. Thirdly, the climate of love of the brethren. And then finally, the feasibility of love of the brethren. Now remember, we are coming into the middle of John's conclusion concerning love of the brethren. He has already addressed the fact of their love of the brethren, the explanation for their love of the brethren, the example of love for the brethren, the obligation to love the brethren, and the significance of love for the brethren. And now he comes to the fruit of love of the brethren. Notice what John says in verse 17 and following of 1 John chapter 4. Herein is love made perfect with us, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, Because as He is, even so are we in this world. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has punishment. And he that fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Now John begins this section by saying, Herein or in this is love made perfect with us. Or more literally, in this the love with us has been perfected. In this the love with us has been perfected. And now this word perfected is the same word we discussed back up in verse 12. In verse 12, John says, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. And we saw that this word perfected, the Greek word teleo, means to be complete, or to come to an end, or to accomplish. In verse 12, John is saying, If we love one another, God's love has come to its intended end in us. That is, God's love for us has produced what God intends for it to accomplish. And what He intends for His love to accomplish in us is our love for one another. Our love for the brethren is God's love for us having come to its God-ordained end. Now, back in verse 17, using this same word, John says, In this the love with us has been perfected. And I suggest that he is speaking of the same love as up in verse 12. John is speaking of the love of God. That is, God's love for his people, a love which is with he and his readers. He is speaking of God's love for them in the words of one commentator, which was their companion, which is with us, says John. In this, the love with us has been perfected. In this, God's love for us, which is our companion, has come to its God-ordained end. In this, God has produced what He intended to produce by loving us. Now, the next question we must address is, what is the this? In this, the love with us has come to its intended end. What is the this? Well, I suggest that it is the same thing John was speaking of back up in verse 12. In verse 12, he says, If we love one another, His love has come to its intended end in us. The this in verse 17 is the love for one another of verse 12. The context of this entire section is love for the brethren. John has said in verse 16, He that abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. In this, verse 17, the love with us has been perfected. An echo of verse 12. In loving one another, God's love which is with us has reached its God-ordained end, exactly what he said in verse 12. In this, that is, in loving the brethren, The love of God, which is our companion, has reached its God-ordained end. But then notice what else John says in verse 17. In this, that is, in loving one another, the love, that is, the love of God, which is with us, has been perfected, that is, has come to its intended end, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Here John is pointing out one of the results of God's love for his people, which has produced in them love for the brethren. And the result of that love for the brethren is confidence in the day of judgment. Now notice what John is saying. He is telling his readers that there is a cause and effect chain reaction going on here. A cause and effect chain reaction going on here. He has already said that God's love for his people produces in his people love for one another. Now he adds to that that this love for the brethren, this love for one another, in turn results in confidence in the day of judgment. 
Now John has already addressed this issue of confidence, this issue of boldness already in this letter. In verse 28 of chapter 2, he says, And now, my little children, abide in him, that if he shall be made manifest, we may have boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. In verse 21 of chapter 3, in this same context of love for the brethren, he says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have boldness toward God. And now for the third time, John uses this same word when he says in verse 17 of chapter 4, In this the love with us has been perfected, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. His point is this. If there is in us a habitual, self-sacrificing, unconditional, Christ-like love for the brethren, if there is in us the kind of love for the brethren which he has been describing, the kind of love exemplified by God sending his only begotten Son into the world that we might live, if that kind of love for the brethren is in us, we can face the day of judgment with boldness, we can face the day of judgment with confidence, because that love of the brethren is evidence that God's love for his people is effectually working in us. True love of the brethren does not grow in Adamic soil. So if we have love for the brethren, the only way it can be explained is that it is the fruit of God's love for us as one of his children. That's what he says back up in verse 7 of chapter 4. Love is of God. And everyone that loves has been begotten of God and knows God. That being so, the presence in us of true biblical love for the brethren is proof that we have been born of God which in turn gives us confidence as we look to the day of judgment. And the reason for that, says John in the last part of verse 17, is because as he is, even so are we in this world. We may have boldness. We may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, even so are we in this world. And of course, the he here is Christ. So John is saying to his readers, the reason we can be confident concerning the day of judgment, the reason we do not need to fear the day of judgment is because we are like Christ. Not we have to wait to be like Christ, but even now, in this world, presently, we are as he is. As he is in what respect? Well, the context suggests that we are as Christ is with respect to loving the brethren, but also as Christ is with respect to the day of judgment. Jesus Christ has no fear of the day of judgment. He has no sin for which to be judged. His relationship with God the Father is such that judgment is not an issue. And John says to the people of God, we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, even so are we. If we are in Christ, positionally our relationship with the judge is the same as his. As he has no sin for which to be judged, because of his substitutionary sacrifice for us, we too have no sin for which to be judged. Therefore, we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, even so are we in this world. And notice what it is that gives us the assurance that we are as he is with respect to the day of judgment. Notice what it is that gives us the assurance that we are as he is with respect to the day of judgment. John says in verse 18 of chapter 4, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has punishment, and he that fears has not been perfected in love. John brings the discussion right back around to the issue of loving the brethren. That's what the term perfect love is referring to. Perfect love, as we saw in verse 12 and in verse 17, is God's love for his people which has produced the God-ordained result of his people loving one another. John says the presence of that love of the brethren 
the presence of God's love for his people which has produced the God ordained end result of our loving one another that love casts out fear why why he says because fear has punishment Fear is a reaction to anticipated punishment. If there were no punishment associated with the day of judgment, there would be no need to fear it. So fear and punishment are related. But John says the existence of the end product of God's love, the existence of our love for the brethren, does away with that fear of punishment because love of the brethren is evidence that as Christ is, so are we. To which John is quick to add in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Bringing his readers back to the initial cause of this chain reaction, John says we may have confidence in the day of judgment. The cause of that, the cause of that confidence, says John, is that complete love that love of the brethren has cast out the fear of punishment. And the cause of that love of the brethren is that we are like Christ. And the cause of our being like Christ is that God first loved us. Now, even though this is a difficult argument to follow, John's point simply stated, remembering that he is writing to strengthen the assurance of his readers, to strengthen their assurance of salvation, John's point is, if we practice love of the brethren, which he stated clearly in verse 7 that his readers did, this love of the brethren is proof that God's saving love is effectually working in us. Which means that, as far as the day of judgment is concerned, we are like Christ, and therefore can have confidence. Another way of saying, if we love the brethren, that should give us assurance that we are truly God's people. The fruit of love of the brethren is confidence in the day of judgment. Now that John has addressed this specific fruit of love of the brethren, beginning in verse 20, he speaks of the consistency of love for the brethren. The consistency of love for the brethren. Notice what he says beginning in verse 20 of 1 John chapter 4. If a man says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that is not loving his brother whom he has seen cannot be loving God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten of God. And whosoever is loving him that begat loves him also that has been begotten of him. John begins this section with the now familiar words, If a man says. If a man says. Early on in our studies, we noticed that John's use of this or a similar phrase was an indication that he was about to address one of the heresies of the false teachers who who had been troubling his readers. For instance, in chapter 1 in verse 6, John says, If we say that we have fellowship with him but walk in darkness, we lie. In verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. In verse 10 of that same chapter, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. In verse 4 of chapter 2, he that says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. In these and in other places where John introduces a statement with the phrase, if we say, or he that says, or if a man says, in those places he is alluding to one of the beliefs or practices of their former teachers. And that is how John is using this phrase at the beginning of verse 20 of 1 John 4. He says, if a man says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. He is speaking specifically of the Gnostic false teachers whom he called antichrists. 
These former teachers made a profession of loving God. But because of their belief that only the Gnostic elite really knew God, and because they considered John's readers to be their spiritual inferiors, they related to them in an unloving way, even to the point of causing them to seriously doubt their own standing before God. By inspiration of the Spirit, John responds to that by saying, If a man says, I love God, but he hates that is, he does not love his brother, he is a liar. His point being, a person who does not love his brothers in Christ does not really love God no matter what he professes. And in this statement, John leaves no room for exceptions because a literal translation is if any were, if anyone, the Greek word tis, if anyone says I love God but hates his brother, he is a liar. So everyone who makes a profession of loving God whose profession is not accompanied by biblical love for the brethren. According to the Spirit of God Himself, that profession is false, and that with no exceptions. But John does not just stop with this statement of fact. He goes on to give his reason for making such a strong statement. He says in verse 20, If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For or because he that does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Because, says John, he that does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now this word, which is translated cannot, is the Greek word dunamai. It means to have the ability or to have the power to do something. John is saying, he that does not love his brother whom he has seen does not have the ability to love God whom he has not seen. Now John does not explain why that is so. He simply states it as a fact. But by using this word of ability, he gives us a clue as to why it is so. Clearly the ability to love God and to love our brethren comes from God. In verse 4, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 7 of chapter 4, John says love is from God. So the ability to love God, the ability to love our brethren, comes from God himself. And just as clearly, both love for God and love for the brethren are the fruits of regeneration. Again, in verse 7 of chapter 4, everyone that loves has been begotten of God and knows God. So one of the fruits of being born of the Spirit of God is love. But not love that is selective. The Spirit of God does not give to His people the ability to love God while withholding from us the ability to love the brethren. What John is teaching here is that when the Spirit bestows the fruit of love upon His people at regeneration, it is a universal love. And if that spirit wrought love is not active in our relationships with our brethren, that is an indication that the person does not have the ability to love God either. It is a package deal. And that's why John says, He that does not love his brother whom he has seen does not have the ability to love God whom he has not seen. So to profess love for God while not loving the brethren is inconsistent. And John says, one who says anything different is a liar. But then not only is the ability to love God and the ability to love the brethren part of the same spiritual endowment, in verse 21, John reminds his readers that love for both is a command of God. Notice verse 21 of chapter 4. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. So not only is loving God while failing to love the brethren inconsistent, loving God while failing to love the brethren is disobedient. And then in verse 1 of chapter 5, 
John brings this section to a close by saying, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten of God. And whosoever loves him that beget loves him also that has been begotten of him. John has just reminded his readers of God's commandment to love the brethren. Now to make sure they understand who these brethren are, in the first part of verse 1 of chapter 5, he identifies them. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten of God. Your brethren, says John, are anyone, whosoever, anyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ that immediately eliminates their former teachers. They did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. They believed that the human Jesus and the divine Christ were two different persons. Clearly, they were not born of God. They were not to be considered to be brethren. But concerning true brethren, concerning those who do believe that Jesus is the Christ, John repeats as a statement of fact what he has just commanded in verse 21 of chapter 4. He says in the last part of verse 1 of chapter 5, And whosoever loves him that begat, that is, whosoever loves him that gave birth, loves him also that has been begotten or has been born of him. Now who is him that begat? Well, clearly this is speaking of God. In the first part of the verse, they are begotten of God. The one who does the begetting, the one who gives birth, is God. And who is he that has been begotten of him? Who is he that has been begotten of God? Well, clearly this is a reference to the brethren in Christ. In the first part of the verse, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ are the ones who have been begotten of God. So John's conclusion is that anyone who loves God also loves those who have been born of God, that is, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ. A statement of fact. Not what should be, but what is. He says, as a statement of fact, everyone who loves God loves the brethren. There is the consistency of love. If we love the Father, we will love His children. If we love God, we will love the brethren. If we do not love the brethren, we do not love God. It is either both or neither one. Then, having addressed the fruit of love of the brethren, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, and having addressed the consistency of love of the brethren, whosoever loves him that gives birth also loves him that has been born of him. The next thing John addresses is the climate of love of the brethren. The climate of love of the brethren. Notice what he says beginning in verse 2 of chapter 5. Hereby we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Here John's point is very simple and very logical. If we really love God, we will keep His commandments. One of His commandments is, as we have just seen in verse 21 of chapter 4, one of His commandments is that His people love one another. Therefore, if we really love God, we will keep His commandment to love one another. With the implication being, if we do not love the brethren... We do not really love God. So what is the climate of love of the brethren? When we are practicing love of the brethren, we are manifesting love for God. Because he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So you see, there is no way to separate love for God and love for God's people like their former teachers were doing. Because it is all part of the same package. If we are loving God's people, we are loving God. And if we love God, we will love His people. So the climate of love of the brethren is love for God. You see, John is continuing to point out the inconsistency of the teaching and example of their former teachers. 
Then beginning in the middle of verse 3, John concludes this section with a discussion of what I am calling the feasibility of love of the brethren. The feasibility of love of the brethren. John has just told his readers with an emphasis upon God's commandment to love the brethren that only those who are keeping his commandments have true love for God. That means that the keeping of God's commandments is a crucial issue. Because if we are not keeping those commandments, we have no reason to believe that we really love God or that we have been savingly loved by God. So having, having presented the keeping of God's commandments as the weighty issue that it is, beginning in the middle of verse 3, John addresses the feasibility of keeping those commandments. He says, in the middle of, beginning in the middle of verse 3, And his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever has been begotten of God is overcoming the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And who is he that is overcoming the world? But he that is believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Now our time is quickly getting away from us, so I'm not going to unpack all that this portion contains, but rather I'm going to seek to explain John's main point and especially as it relates to this issue of loving the brethren, which after all is the central issue of this portion of his concluding remarks. His readers have just been told that all true children of God must practice the keeping of God's commandments. And clearly, that is a tall order. And if attempted by the natural man, it would be impossible. But for the true child of God, says John, God's commandments are not grievous. God's commandments are not grievous. Now this word which is translated grievous is the Greek word barus, which means heavy. So John is saying God's commandments are not heavy. In other words, in God's commandments, God is not commanding that we carry something that we cannot carry. And in verse 4, John explains why that is so. He says, God's commandments are not heavy, for or because whosoever has been begotten or whosoever has been born of God is overcoming the world. And again, in verse 5, he identifies those who have been born of God as those to whom God has revealed the Son, which again leaves out their former teachers. Notice what he says in verse 5. And who is he that is overcoming the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So John's point is that God's commandments, with a special emphasis on his commandment to love the brethren, even though impossible for unregenerate men like their former teachers, God's commandments are doable by those who have been born of God because one of the results of the new birth is the overcoming of the spiritual ineptness of the citizens of this spiritually dead world. God not only commands love of the brethren, one of the fruits of the new birth is the ability to love the brethren. That's what makes the commandments of God or the keeping of the commandments of God, feasible. Because not only does God command love of the brethren, one of the fruits of the new birth is the ability to love the brethren. Now this morning we have looked at the second half of John's conclusion concerning love of the brethren. In this portion of his letter, John addressed the subject of the fruit of love of the brethren. In verse 17 he said, In this, that is, this love for the brethren. In this, the love, the love of God with us has been perfected or has come to its intended end that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. So the fruit that is produced in God's people as we behold ourselves loving one another is confidence that we are like Christ and that we need not fear the day of judgment. The second thing John addressed was the subject of the consistency of love of the brethren. In verse 1 of chapter 5, he summarized this section when he said, Whosoever loves him that gives birth loves him also that is born of him. His point is, 
that a true child of God loves both God and the people of God, and that one who does not love both loves neither. The third thing John addressed was the subject of the climate of love of the brethren. In which he said in verse 2 of chapter 5, In this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. So the climate of love of the brethren is that of a general love for God which results in the keeping of His commandments. One of which is love one another, even as I have loved you. Then the fourth thing, fourth thing John addressed was the subject of the feasibility of love for the brethren, in which John said, Obeying this commandment to love one another is feasible because God's commandments are not heavy, and the ability to obey, the overcoming of this world's spiritual limitations, is a fruit of being born of God. Now let me ask you a question. As you consider your relationship with the people of God, how does that affect your thinking about the day of judgment? As you consider your relationship with the people of God, how does that affect your thinking about the day of judgment? And I know that most of us have not considered these two things as being related. But clearly through his servant John, the Spirit of God puts these two things together. One of the things God intended to produce with his love for his people was love for one another. And one of the things God intended to be the result of our love for one another was a greater confidence concerning the day of judgment. That is why John raised the issue at this point. The confidence of his readers had been shaken by these false teachers. John is writing in order to build their confidence back up. He has observed that his readers love the brethren, so he says to them, that love of the brethren should give you a greater confidence that you are like Christ, not only in your love for the people of God, but that you are like Christ in that you need not fear the punishment of the day of judgment, because loving the brethren is evidence that God has savingly loved you. So he mentions love of the brethren and the day of judgment in the same breath because there is a connection between the two. Now, as you consider your relationship with the people of God, how does that affect your thinking about the day of judgment? Are you confident about that day because you observe in you a love for your brothers and sisters in Christ which cannot be explained in any other way except it be the Spirit of God at work in you? Is your confidence concerning the day of judgment strengthened as you do what you do for the good of your brethren, even if it means great personal cost to yourself? Or does your relationship to your brethren cause you to fear that great day? Cause you to fear because you know that you really do not love them? Oh, you may be friendly enough. You may make a meal when asked to, or you may uh, lend a hand to help a brother move. But real giving of yourself to the brethren is just not what you're all about. If that describes you, according to the inspired apostle, you not only do not love the brethren, you do not love God. Because he that does not love his brother whom he has seen does not have the ability to love God whom he has not seen. Again, we see what a major issue love of the brethren really is. If we practice it, the love of God is our companion, the righteousness of Christ is our portion, and we need not fear the day of judgment. But if we do not practice love of the brethren, no matter what we profess, we do not love God, and the day of judgment will be our worst nightmare. So you see, love of the brethren is a very important issue. John spent more time on it than anything else in this letter. It's not an issue we can afford to ignore. May God grant us the discernment we need as we seek to determine if we have this vital characteristic of the true people of God. Well, our time is gone. 
Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We ask that you would help us to examine our lives in light of your word. Help us to examine ourselves to see if we have the fruit of the new birth, that fruit which causes us to love you and causes us to love our brethren. And if we have this fruit of love of the brethren and love for you, Help us to be more thankful, for we know that it has come from you, for love is of God. But our Father, as we examine our lives and we do not see this fruit, help us to know that we are not your true people, and to fall upon our face, to turn to Christ and turn from our sin. Be with us, our Father, that we would put these things into practice in our lives, that we would examine our lives in light of them. We ask for your blessings as we seek to assimilate the things we have learned this morning and put them into practice. For Christ's sake, amen.